Well, good morning, everybody. It is uh, about that time to begin our study uh, for this morning. Um, as we as we get started, if you will, join with me uh, in a word of prayer. Our Lord and Father, we are grateful to you for the many blessings of this day that you have uh, given to us. We thank you for the ability to be here together. We thank you for the uh, for all of those who are able to be with us uh, in the spirit through uh, the Facebook feed and, and many other ways, and we are uh, grateful for the uh, ability to, to have this uh, uh, fellowship, even though separated by distance due to many reasons. And Father, we ask that uh, you might remove those uh, boundaries, uh, that they could be with us once again. We thank you, Father, for your servant James, and um, we thank you for uh, all the ways that he has taught us, and as we... Uh, conclude this this morning we uh, ask that you will grant us wisdom as you have promised to do uh, through your servant we ask all of this in your son's name amen all right so we've we've looked at every single verse of the book of james maybe not in fullest details always but we've managed and so here we are at the end um now, at its core, James is a James is a functional book. That's the way I would put it. That is, James is very much about getting your Christianity to use. Okay, um, there's a lot of other writings. Paul is what I would consider largely a doctrinal writer. That is, a lot of Paul's writings are about learning learning what it is to be a Christian. And that is absolutely necessary. How are we going to do something we don't know what it is, right? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not going to walk down. I'm not, I'm not going to drive to Hanford and walk in an OR suite and say, you know, I've watched a lot of medical shows. You know, ER. I watched every season. I'm ready, right? Not. Not how it works, right? We've got to. <laughs> We've got to learn what what it is to be a Christian. And so, and Paul does a lot of that. We see, and we're seeing that in the book of Acts and his missionary journeys and the way that he then revisits many of these places and writes letters to these places because we've got to continue to learn and we've got to continue to have a better, deeper understanding of what it is to be a Christian. But we also need people like James and John and others who write more focused books about, okay, Go do. Because it's also easy as Christians to get trapped into a cycle of, well, I'm learning and I'm learning and I'm learning. But even at our base levels of learning, there are still things that we have to do. And so James is one of those writers. And remember, he is likely uh, the first writer of our New Testament. It's undetermined whether he his writing predates the letters to the, Thess, uh, to the Thessalonians or not, but it's probably right in that same time frame, okay? And so that tells us that he didn't expect this to only be a book that is for the seasoned of the seasoned, okay? Because there's not been anything even called the church for more than about 15 years at the time of the writing of this book. And so, and not to say that 15 years isn't a lot of time for somebody to mature, but this isn't a book that's only for people who have been Christians for decades and decades and decades, because nobody had. And remember, at this time, many people in the church, while the church as a whole had existed for that long, remember for the first few years, the church didn't grow a whole lot outside of Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And it wouldn't really be until Paul begins his missionary journeys that the church really uh, gets to, you know, spreading throughout the world as, as we understand it. So, uh, you know, James is writing here, admonishing these Christians to get to work. Now, he does this in a number of ways. And we're just going to kind of do a survey over and then we'll talk a little bit about the book and, uh, you know, where we where we are with it. But 
he starts it off, and, and it's where you, all Christians have to start off, and the first place that we've got to get to work is on us and our relationship with God. And that's what chapter 1 is all about. And he talks about counting it joy when we fall into these temptations. He, he talks about uh, our need to have an understanding that sin is largely brought about because I allow it into my life. And then he talks about us not needing, we have to be careful that we don't get angry with God because he calls me out on my sin. And so the first place that we've got to get to work as Christians is in our own lives. But we've got to get to work, right? Uh, he's going to, James is going to later say that if we know that something is a sin and we don't do it, and he's talking in a specific context and we'll get to that, but, um, you know, as I'm learning, if I come across a passage that tells me, hey, what you're doing right there, not okay. I can't get angry about that. I can't get upset that God would tell me no. I've got to fix it. Um, and it's about keeping it in perspective. You know, it starts off with this idea of respect, and then it kind of moves into this idea of love when we talk about our relationship with God. And love and respect is absolutely where it has to be founded when it comes to our relationship with God. A respect for his word and a love for him that even if I don't understand or even if I disagree, which good luck with that, um, he's God and I am not. You know, it's an understanding of my roles and understanding of uh, many of those types of things. And so then we have to um, address those things in our lives. And, you know, he kind of closes chapter one with this reminder that if we don't do that, can we really call ourselves Christians? If I'm not really willing to work on myself and my spirituality, am I truly following Christ and the Father? Or am I like that man who looks at himself in the mirror and then turns around and doesn't even remember what he looks like? Because that's what he's saying, is you can't put out this idea of Christian and then turn around and not behave in like manner. Then we get to chapter 2. And throughout the rest of the book, James is going to address our relationships with other Christians and other people in general, but it's all going to come back to this base idea of everything that we do being based in my relationship with God first. Okay, so he talks about partiality in chapter 2 and, and disrespecting people because of uh, whatever reason, he uses the specific instance of wealth versus poverty, but really it's, you know, bigger than that. And I think we can all see that, that it, it's not okay to be partial to somebody for any other reason. Okay. It's not okay to be partial on the, you know, status of race or marital status or any of those things any more than it's okay to be partial because somebody is rich or poor. Um, but again, why? Why, are, why do we not act partially? Why do we not mistreat people who come from maybe backgrounds that we don't understand or don't like? Well, he comes back to it because of my relationship with Christ. And that's when he gets into this discussion of, of faith and works. How can I demonstrate my faith? By my actions. Don't think that the two are, di are uncoupled. <laughs> They're written one right after another. And so if my actions don't match my, my faith, you know, Jesus spent a lot of time with the poor. He spent a lot of time with people with backgrounds that were very not good. Right? Now, he always spent that time trying to bring them out of that and into a good relationship with God, but... We've got to meet people where they are. That'd be like, that'd be like you know, the, the rescue workers when somebody's trapped in a well. Well, if you can get yourself up to here, we'll pull you the rest of the way out. It's not how it works. And so we have to demonstrate 
that we truly follow Jesus by acting like him. Now, we have to walk a line, right? We have to be in the world, not of the world, and that gets difficult when we spend time with people who are in the world. It gets difficult because while we are trying to exert a positive influence, they are not necessarily trying, but they often do exert a not positive influence, right? And so, you know, we've got to maintain. And then there are some times where, you know what? We have to be real with ourselves and we have to take that step back. Not taking a step back as in walking away from them, never speaking to them again. But like Jesus, there are some times when we're going to need to retreat back to security with our brothers and sisters, with myself in prayer on the mountain, so to speak, right? Sometimes we've got to come back to ground so that we can go back out and be that positive influence. Uh, <clears throat> and again, we've got to put that faith into action. Then he talks about what the dangers of putting our faith into action. In chapter 3, he talks about the tongue and the fire and having to be careful, right? We're trying to exert a positive influence. We're trying to overcome some difficult things. And, well, sometimes we're going to put our size 10s in our mouth. Or worse. If we're not careful. Now, everybody gets tongue-tied. Everybody says something that they don't that they wish they could take back, but the idea is that we've got to be cautious and we've got to be aware of that danger and try to avoid it. We've got to get control of every part of our being. And James makes the point, well, okay, so you're getting out there and maybe you're, you're getting your physical actions under control. You've, you've, you're you know, moving on from this bad habit or that and you're, you're making positive choices and changes. But if you're not changing the way you talk with people and what you say, you're still not getting there. You know what struck me is the, uh, the, the issue that he's addressing in regards to uh, wealth and, and being partial and having preference for certain things and money and our mouth and, and he's No, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is he's he's absolutely writing this to Christians in his day. So these were problems for the church back then, and they're still problems today. It's not, you know, the human condition hasn't changed really since the garden. I mean, um, the first murder happened within the family, the very first family that existed on the earth. So there's been these problems forever. Um, but as James is trying to drive home to us, as Christians, our, our relationship with God pushes us to try to overcome what we were and to be something better. Um, and gives us the encouragement and the knowledge that we can. Okay? I think that's really kind of the biggest thing and, and why, I, to me, some people might read James in these and, oh, well, he, all he keeps saying is how bad they're being. And to me, it's more of a, I, I see James and, and John in the same way that they're, to me, they're more of a cheerleader. They're saying, you can be better than this. You need to be better than this, but more importantly, you can be better than this. See, because there's a lot of people who know they should change, Right? Every person I've ever met that smokes knows they should stop smoking. 
because they can feel it. They can feel <laughs> the, the crackle in their lungs. They can feel the shortness of breath. They can, you know, they can feel the, uh, you know, the, the decay of their teeth and things like that. They know, but a lot of them don't think they can. They can't even imagine a life without that. And that's the power of Jesus is he shows us a better life, a life without all of those encumbrances, a life that is what God intended it to be. And that's where James, you know, he's telling us these things and he's, he's pointing us to Jesus, rightfully so, right? He did it. You know, and, and there's, never, there's never a denial that, hey, we've already made the mistake. There's a reason that Jesus had to die for us. But we can do this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, then he gets into, in the later part of chapter 3 and into chapter 4, he starts talking about what happens to those internal relationships, right? Because we're out in the world and we're trying to overcome and we're having that negative influence, you know, pushed back at us. And so then maybe we do. We go back and we're like, okay, this is my, this is my safe area. I'm with my brothers and sisters. But all that stress has got to go somewhere, right? All that stress and strain. And James is warning us, okay, we've got to find outlets for that stress and strain, and we absolutely need each other to get through this. But that doesn't mean that the answer is to then start fighting amongst ourselves. Right? It, it's not time to come home and start pointing fingers at my brothers and sisters because the world's been pointing fingers at me all week. That's not going to help anybody. And so we have to put aside any of those worldly thoughts, you know, the jealousy, selfish ambition, disorder, all of these things. And we've got to instead be pure and peaceable and gentle, reasonable, merciful, uh, you know, without hypocrisy, unwavering in our faith, all of these things. And when we do that, and we come together, it, we can have that release amongst Christians. We can kind of go, <sighs> and we can talk about how, hard it was this week maybe to deal with the world without fighting amongst each other without quarreling and, and without you know it's one of those things what do we want it's it's why things like comfort food exist right we get stressed out what do we want i want mac and cheese i want mashed potatoes i want deep fry that twinkie twice let's do this right We, we, we go for those things uh, that aren't always healthy for us, right? But it, it, it's one of those things. We've got to deal with that stress in a better way, in the same way that eating away our stress is not going to help any of us, right? It's not going to help any of us to come together with our, the family of God and bring all of those problems of the world in. This is supposed to be a place that is free from that stuff, that we don't have to deal with that. You know, the thing is that because we're doing it from the it's it's just hard. It's a lot of work. And, it is. And sometimes we just prefer, I mean, I should speak for myself, just to, to be, to isolate and to be more with the people that we don't have to work so hard because we kind of, we kind of think alike, so it's, it's safer and easier. But, I mean, definitely, I know for sure, like you say, we all try to try to separate you. I know for sure that the best thing is to be out there. You know, to work the other ones like me, even though sometimes we don't agree and it's uncomfortable and we have to put up because I have to put up with the one thing that I don't agree with and they have to put up with the things that I think about that don't align, align with their taste or liking. And it's just hard. I don't even feel talking about it. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing about, you know, the church, we're, we're not necessarily going to always see eye to eye on everything, but we're 
we're all supposed, you know, you said something that people that think like me, well, we're supposed to. Jesus said we're supposed to be like-minded. Paul talks about being of the same accord, right? What does that mean? Well, that means at the end of the day, and this is what James gets to in the middle of chapter four is, okay, how do we deal with that stress? It's not deep fried Twinkies. It's not yelling at each other. It's submitting to God. And that's the whole thing is when everybody in the room is submitting to God, resisting, that's where we find their commonness and that's where we find that safety and that's where we can all go, oh, yeah, we're okay, we're all, we're all dealing with this, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and, and there's, a, there's an understanding about these things too. Like, you know, we use those, those uh, phrases like we're in the same boat and that's really not always true, even of Christians in the same congregation. We're in the same storm, okay? Um, but, you know, you might be fighting just to, just to kind of keep the thing above water. While somebody else's main concern is just not, you know, getting blown around by the wind. It's the same storm, but it might be affecting your little boat differently. Absolutely. I mean, (laughs) I I want you know, using the idea of a boat in the storm. What was Jesus doing? He was asleep asleep because he knew it was going to be fine. And there again, the, the, the danger, and this is one of the things that he talks about in this, this quarreling amongst one another and this jealousy is, I can't be jealous because my brother is so calm. Right? When Peter and the others come to Jesus, they're like, what are you doing? We're going to die. They were angry because he was sleeping. No, he knew it was okay. Okay. He remembered who was in control, and it put him at ease. And I, we, you know, we've got to learn not to, you know, have those same reactions of how can they be so calm in all of this? And sometimes I think we mistake calm for apathy. Um, what's that? It is absolutely. And so that that's what it comes down to is. And even speak, you know, he comes, he mentions this submission, then he comes back in verse 11 of chapter 4, talking about not speaking against each other. So that tells us that he never changed his subject. The solution to not quarreling in the church and the solution to having that, that base and that foundation of comfort and safety and calm is that everybody is submitting to God. And putting it in his hands and and reminding one another, hey, I know it was a hard week. I know you had to deal with this, that, and the other. Just put it in God's hands. Not that that's easy, okay? You know, uh, to reinforce your point that you uh, so aptly didn't didn't make, I I branched down my Bible, and at the end of chapter 7, we're talking about how do we resist sometimes as far as, uh, anyway, the last Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, If you didn't hear, Billy is referencing uh, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, that we resist the devil and he flees and we draw near to God and he will draw near to us. And and that's it. And it's, it's, it's in those moments when we do that, when we truly submit, I really do feel, you know, I'm not trying to be like weird spirituality, but we can absolutely feel the presence of God. We can feel, oh, as Paul puts it, a peace that passes understanding because we know that we're okay. It doesn't matter what happens. He's going to take care of us. And so then he comes back with this same idea. Uh, 
you know, not being boastful, not being arrogant in our in our spirituality. And he comes back in chapter five to wealth, because remember, especially in the early church, this was a big deal. The, you know, if we think we have a huge uh, wealth distribution problem in our modern world, they had an even bigger one back then. OK, um, by the way, nothing new. There's always been one percenters. OK. Um, and, you know, he talks about not abusing the power that we might have, regardless of how much power that is. Um, and so then we've got to, and why, do we, why don't we do that? Why don't we take advantage of other people? Why don't we step on people to get what we want? Well, because we're following Jesus. And he uh, starts to close chapter 5 because we're waiting for Jesus to return. And do you want Jesus to return when you've got your soul firmly planted on another person's head to get a leg up in this world? Is that how you want Jesus to find you? I hope not. You know, and, and you know, that was one thing that struck me. I had a, a brother tell me that one time. He said, the easiest thing to do to determine whether or not something is sinful is to ask yourself, is that what I want to be doing when Jesus comes back? If I'm engaging in something and Jesus comes back at that moment, is that something that I'm going to be going, good timing, or, oh no. Because there is something, you know, the, the New Testament talks about that even things that maybe are not explicitly stated as sinful, if it bothers my conscience that I do it, then I shouldn't be doing it. And so, you know, he, he starts with our relationship with God and then he comes back and he closes with it, okay? So it starts off that we have joy in our lives and we're striving to be better because he gives us the ability to be better. And the point of driving to be better is so that we can eagerly wait for his return. So we can endure, so that we can overcome, so that we can well, be, be better and be more than we could have been had we tried to go it alone. And then he comes back, the last part of chapter 5, and our relationship with each other driving that relationship with God. As he talks about people who are sick, calling for the elders, and making sure that, you know, as they say, your affairs are in order. But James, neither James or Jesus really cares if your inheritance documents are in order. It matters if your soul is in order. And that's why he then closes, if those among you stray from the truth and we turn them back, let him know that he turn, who turns a sinner away from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And, you know, again, it comes back to this relationship and what are we doing? Why are we doing these things? Why are we, why are we putting in action these things in my own life and putting them in action and trying to demonstrate them and, and show them and teach them to others? Why am I trying to have this better life? Well, to save souls. And take a little bit more sin out of the world. That's our goal. And so that's the book of James in a nutshell. Uh, thoughts or comments or passages that, that struck you through our study? Uh, we've got some time to discuss some things, but not really enough time to start on anything new. Um... <laughs> But I, I hope that you enjoyed this study. I, I know the book of James is one that we talk about it a lot in the church. I think I've sat through more classes on James than probably any other New Testament book. And I think there's a reason for that. I know it's one of my favorites, but um, I think it's ease of understanding helps. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah, you know the, you know as Bill said, the tongue and and how it you know can inflict so much pain and the the examples that he uses of the 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 bit and the bridle and the horse and being able to control these large animals with such a little thing and yet that little thing can also then drive that big animal to to do some really crazy things and same thing for us right and uh, the way that James puts it if we stumble. Uh, that we can be perfect in everything, but if we don't control the tongue, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if everything else in our life is perfect, if we're constantly lashing out at people, or if we're constantly talking in ways or about things that we shouldn't be, then there's no difference. And, and that's, I think, I think in a lot of ways that's a challenge for Everyone, not just in the first century, not just today, but, you know, we have to remember that in antiquity and amongst the Jewish people, and if there were, you know, sins of greater nature, if you will, right? And it's sometimes easy to forget that, okay, just because even under the law, not every single sin required the extravagance of certain sacrifices, they still all required sacrifice, And as for us as Christians, we don't, we don't have that, I guess, in-your-face confrontation of having to literally sacrifice an animal for our sins. And so I think it's then easy for us to think, well, you know, that's just a little thing. You know, when it comes to things involving the tongue, whether it's lying or, uh, you know, lashing out in anger um, is a big one in the New Testament as well. Um, you know, or, or speaking of vulgar things, as Paul puts it, and that wouldn't really that we, we think about that. And, you know, speaking of vulgar things would encompass using the seven words you can't use on TV, right? Uh, that would encompass, you know, talking about things of, uh, of a nature that are just not good to talk about, whether, you know, whatever that may be. Um, you know, Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, James addresses the idea of of, of wealth uh, a couple times in a relatively short book, and so that kind of puts an emphasis on it. But um, you know, as I was uh, finishing up with my thought on the tongue, um, you know, he talks about here. You know, we can't have blessings and cursings coming from the same place. You know. Um, and again, this idea that just because maybe I'm not physically acting out the sin, it's not a sin. It absolutely is. Um, and so, you know, we've got to be aware of that. Um, but yeah, as far as money goes, you know, nowhere in the New Testament does it ever condemn having wealth. And Paul is often and almost constantly misquoted that, by the way, Money is not the root of evil. Okay? For one, this is just a piece of paper. Okay? And by the way, that's absolutely true because the value of this piece of paper goes up and down. Mostly down. Mostly down. But that's the thing is that it doesn't, it's, it's not real when you really get down to it, okay? Because you could have literally millions of those little pieces of paper stored up 
But if one catastrophe happens, all you've got is very fancy tissue. Right? By the way, it happens. Nations collapse all the time. The United States has actually had at least three different currency forms that are now defunct. So where, where does it lie? Where does our hope lie? Well, it can't be with something that's imaginary and based on things that are well outside of my control could be completely worthless tomorrow. Money is just like everything else that we have. We use it to get from here to there. Yeah, it's an expedient. It's to be doing. Yep. Yeah. It it's a it's necessary, right? Sure. You have to you have to have it. You have to exchange it for things, right? In the same way, and, and that's what James is talking about in chapter five. You know, <laughs> nobody works because they just want to, right? Nobody works for somebody else because they want to, right? Because if you had the money where you didn't have to work, you'd go do what you want. You might still do physical labor, but you're not going to be bound to somebody else in their time schedule, right? Okay? So everybody goes to work because they have to. Yeah, I was actually. Uh, so we might go work for somebody. Yeah, I was actually watching a, a video about a guy talking about opening up your own business, and he said you'll go from having one boss to having hundreds of bosses because every single customer that walks through the door of your own shop is your boss. He's like, you know, we 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 like to. We like to have these pie in the sky ideas, but we all go to work because we have to. And that's why there are labor laws though, right? It's so that your boss can't make you work for 40 hours, let's say. And then at the end of the week go, well, that was fun, wasn't it? You got a lot of experience. Let's call it even. No, right? Your time is valuable because there's lots of other things that you could be doing with your time. And so when it comes down to the paycheck that we receive from that job, essentially what they're doing is they're pay they're giving you money in exchange for you not being able to go do whatever you want. And so chapter five is about abusing that power, about holding essentially somebody hostage for their time and energy without compensating them for it because simply because you don't want to and have the power to do so. And he says, you, you can't do that. Whether it's as, as an actual physical employer or in any other way in our lives that we might take advantage of somebody and their time and energy. And if we go back to chapter two, right? and the sin of partiality, when we, when we think of it in these terms, it makes even less sense, right? Okay, they're rich right now, but there's a lot of rich people that have gone bankrupt, right? A lot of people that had, well, a little over a decade ago, right? A lot of people who thought they were very wealthy suddenly came out realizing that they didn't really have a whole lot in reality. You know, and all of these things matter. And so, you know, when we think about partiality, whether it's in the context of money or, you know, any of the other things that, that we divide ourselves with, you know, none of it matters. It's not going to matter how much money that we had. It's not going to matter 
how much pigment we had in our skin. It's not gonna matter where our us or our family came from. It's not gonna matter what I did for a living. You know, graves are all basically the same size. And as Solomon put it, we came from the dust and we return to the dust. Most of what happens between those two points in time, when it comes to the physical side of things, not a huge bearing. But when we couch it in that relationship with Jesus and when our conviction and our drive makes us better and makes us exert a better influence in the world, that's when the magic happens. That's when life has a meaning. I mean, just think about how sad of a life it is to start work, let's just say, at 18. I know most of us started before that, but let's just for argumentation, let's say we start work at 18, and you work up until you're 65. Over 40 years of your life, And that's what your that's what your goal was is to get in your in your advancing years to finally be able to sit out under the umbrella on the porch. But that was it. That was that was it. I mean, how sad of a life is that? When that's your only like that's the end all. When you consider that the average lifespan is 75 to 80 years, you spend 40 plus years of your life for 10. If you look at it from a purely worldly standpoint. Of working to build retirement, of working to, to build physical wealth, for 10 years. And that's why Christianity is so much better is because we offer something better than 10 years. Right? And that's the point of all of this and that's the point that James is making is that we've got to stop looking at things the way the world does and we've got to start looking at them the way that God does. And again, it's not about not having a retirement. It's not about refusing wealth. There's no vow of poverty involved with Christianity, but life is so much bigger than any of those things. And again, we have to demonstrate that with our actions and with our the way that we compose ourselves. It goes back to the old saying, it's what you do with what you've got. Yeah. And you learn that usually as a child growing up about sharing and giving there's other people worse off than you are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And really the idea if you didn't hear Alice of doing what you have with what you've got it's not just about money it's the whole book of James. <laughs> what have you got? Well you've got a life. Well what are you doing with it? So let's go out and show people that our faith is alive. All right. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed the study of the book of James. I always enjoy revisiting James, one of my favorite books. Um, Lord willing, next week we will begin looking at the letters of John. Uh, we're going to start, we're actually going to look at the writings of John as a whole. We're going to start with his, uh, with his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Um, and then, if the Lord wills, we will look at the gospel written by John. And then, Lord willing, 
because we're going to continue looking at profits on Wednesday night. So I'm hoping that it's going to work out where we will be ready for the book of Revelation uh, after that. So, um, but we're going to start kind of like with Daniel. We'll start with the easy stuff and then we'll move into the more complicated. And, and I'm not saying that First John is, is kindergarten level Christianity, but it's at least easy to understand. Um, so that's, Lord willing, our, our plan for Sunday morning. And I, uh, I hope uh, that you'll join with us. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.